Hi, how are you doing? Welcome back to Super Awesome Calculus. I'm Augie Kennedy, and we're on Chapter 1, Functions. And today we're going to cover Section 1.5 of James Stewart's book, which is all about exponential functions. But before we do that, uh, I'd like to first talk about the example problem, the big problem from last week. Now, if you may remember, the question was, a stone is dropped into a lake, creating a circular ripple that travels outward at a speed of 60 centimeters a second. I wanted you to A, express the radius, R, of this circle as a function of the time, T, in seconds. And B, if A is the area of this circle as a function of the radius, find A of R and interpret it. So this was an exercise in composite functions. So first, let's look at what we know. We know that a stone is dropped into a lake and it's going to create a ripple. So we're going to be dealing with a circle. So what we need to do is we need to know a little bit about circles. It helps if you know some formulas here. For instance, circumference is 2 pi r. You don't really need that here. And area, which you will need here, is pi r squared. Now, if you knew those things, especially the second part, this problem shouldn't really be that difficult for you. Let's look at it. We have to express the uh, radius of this circle as a function of the time. And we know that the radius grows 60 centimeters per second. So I think it would be fair if we say that r of t, which is the radius as a function of time, is going to be 60 t. It's going to grow 60 centimeters per second. So that's how we're going to work with r of t. Now what we're looking at here is the area of this circle, a of r, is really just the same as a r of t. So what's area? Well area, as we know, is pi r squared. So, we're going to need to do a of r. Now, what we know here is that the r squared is now going to be 60t squared. And that's going to give us our final answer of 3600 pi t squared. And that is the answer. It wasn't that difficult. We just, once we realized that the radius of this circle, it was that the question was telling us what the radius was, we plugged that and just set up a function. And then we plug this function, r of t, into a, which is the area formula. And that's how we got our answer. So that is the answer to the big problem today. Now, last time, I didn't really get to talk, actually at no point thus far have I talked at all about domain and range. And I apologize for that. There are two things that are quite important. They're quite important in the study of calculus. Uh, domain is going to be, a, it's going to be in play for quite a long time, and range is really going to come into play when we start talking about maximum and minimum values. But for now, what you need to know, basically, is domain all x's, range all y's. Or put better, domain is all inputs, range all outputs. Now let's take a look at that, shall we? Um, just very briefly, I'm going to use two very quick examples here. We have the function, everyone's favorite function because it's very easy to use, f of x is x squared. Okay? We know that the domain of this, where is this true? What can I plug into that? Can I plug 0 in? Yes, I'll get 0. Can I plug 1 in? Yes, I'll get 1. 2, 3, I can, I mean, I can plug in any x that I want, and it'll be true. 
How about wives? Well, will I get one? Yes. Will I get two? Yes. Will I get three? Yes. Will I get four? Yes. Five? Yes. Won't get anything down here, but I'll get everything up there. Okay? Um, I'm going to start this part over again. So last time, in fact, at no two. So unfortunately, at no point have I really been able to talk about two things: domain and range. I'd like to just address them very quickly now. Domain is basically the set of all inputs, or x. Range is outputs, or y, or f of x. So for instance, if we get uh, a function like f of x equals x, we know that's a line. Now that's this line right here. We can plug one in to, we can plug in any number, any number x. You can plug in zero. You can plug, you, we can use one, we can use two, three, we can use negative five. Yeah, we can we can use any x, and we can get any y. You know, we can plug in 1, we can plug in 2, 3, 4, negative 1, negative 2. I mean, they're all, they all exist in this function. So if that's the case, if any number exists, we say that the domain or the range are this funny looking r here, which is all real numbers. Okay? Now, when can domain and range be restricted? Well, that happens at a certain point. We're going to use the classic example, f of x equals 1 over x. Okay? This is pretty easy here. Can x equal 1? Yes. 2? Yes. Negative 1? Yes. Negative 2? Yes. Zero? No. We know that one over zero, no. Can't have that. So zero is not part of the domain. And when there isn't a part of the domain, what you're going to get, you're going to get some asymptotes. And what you'll also find is that you'll also never find zero as part of your range. So what we say about that, about the domain there, is that it's either all real numbers such that uh, x does not equal 0, or, or we can say it's the set from negative infinity to 0, closed and 0 to infinity. Keeping these brackets like this as parentheses and not squared off means that u, or means that 0, is not a part of the domain. So we're going we're to be using domain a lot when we start analyzing function, a lot of rational functions. And we're not really going to talk about range too much, but we are going to talk about range when we get into maximum and minimum uh, when we start analyzing functions and finding out what the maximum and minimum are, because that's essentially a calculation of range. So, moving onward. Today we're talking about exponents, uh, and namely exponential functions. Now the basic exponential function is like such. f of x equals a to the x. That's an exponential function. It's not to be confused with the power function, uh, g of x equals x squared. As we can see here, x is base. Here, x is what we're raising to. Um, f of x equals a to the x. You might, if you're, in, if you're familiar with computers at all, you might be very familiar with powers of 2. 2 to the x. f of x equals 2 to the x. 
And what that's basically saying is that if we have f of 3, that's 2 cubed, which is 8, or f of 3 equals 2 times 2 times 2. That's, that's an idea of what an exponential function is. You can have all sorts of exponential functions. You can have, well, you can have a lot of different exponential functions. But there's one function that we're going to be coming back to time and time again. You might as well learn it because it's going to be a huge part of this course. And that is f of x equals e to the x. Now, e is a very mysterious number. We're going to start talking about it in just a second. Uh, e, for those of you who are interested, is basically 2.71828, but I only ever use 2.71, or 2.72 would be a little bit better. But. E to the x, that is called the, uh, that's called the exponential function. It's the exponential function. It's what we're going to be working with whenever we deal with anything exponential. Nine, 99 times out of 100, we'll be using e to the x. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about what that means, but before we do that, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the laws of exponents, just to kind of refresh your memory. So here are some laws of exponents. I'm just going to go right from the book, because they do a pretty good job here. If a to the x plus y is the same as a to the x, a to the y. Okay? So if you ever have like, well, we don't really need to do an example here, but I'm sure you could see it if we have 5 to the x plus 1, that's the same as 5 to the x times 5. And it's the same thing. Um, then there is a to the x minus y. Oop. Drop the marker again. a to the x minus y is a to the x over a to the y. You may remember this because that's how we can prove that a to the 0 equals 1. Because we can have a to the 3 minus 3 equals a cubed over a cubed equals 1. That is, in case you're wondering, why a to the 0 equals 1. Um, what others do we have? We have, so it's pretty basic, a to the x, y equals a to the x, y, uh, associative, I believe, and that's, that's pretty easy to understand and to see. And then there's a, b to the x is a to the x, b to the x kind of like a variation of the top. So those are your rules of exponents. Learn them, know them. I'm sure you probably know them already, but if you don't, there they are, some of them. Those are the basic ones that we'll be using. Now we're going to talk a little bit more about the exponential function. You'll find uh, later in the course, when we talk about differential equations, that we use exponential functions all the time. We use them all the time. So, for now though, we just need to be, we need to understand what it is. So, a to the x is a function, okay? For simplicity's sake, we'll say that e to the x is just like a to the x, except it's a equals 2.7182, or, yeah, a to a. What we know is that graphically, it looks like this. That's not very good. It goes up more, a lot more. Point is, is that the y-intercept is 1 as will be the case whenever you just have an exponential function. It's going to, because anything to the 1 power, or anything to the 0 power is 1, that's why you're always going to have 1 if there's not a uh, transformation there. 
But the thing that's really interesting, and it's something that we're really going to talk about next chapter, is that the tangent line with e to the x has a slope of 1. In other words, at that point, at the point 0, 1, the line that's running right alongside the curve and touching it has a slope of exactly 1, or y equals x. That's why e to the x, and one of the many reasons why e to the x is the function that we're going to use the most when we talk about exponentials. So you can look at it. It's a, it's a nice looking function. It behaves interestingly. And we're going to talk a lot more about it throughout the course. I just wanted to introduce it to you now. So now you know something about the laws of exponents, and you know something about e to the x, which means that you're ready for today's big problem. All right. Today's big problem is, if f of x equals 5 to the x, show that f of x plus h minus f of x over h equals 5 to the x times the quantity f, or 5 to the h minus 1 over h and parentheses. I may have botched saying that, but I'm sure you can see it pretty clearly. Once again, we're, what we're looking for here isn't a number. We're looking for you to just carry out the steps to prove that statement A is statement B. It shouldn't be too hard to do. Uh, just apply some of the lessons we talked about with the laws of exponents and you should be fine. And by the way, this is a sneak peek of derivatives, which we're going to be getting into next chapter. All right. Well, thank you for joining, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye.